A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. This is how Jesus Christ came to be born. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they came to live together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a man of honour and wanting to spare her publicity, decided to divorce her informally. He had made up his mind to do this when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because she has conceived what is in her by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you must name him Jesus because he is the one who is to save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill the words spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had told him to do. He took his wife to his home. This is the gospel of of the Lord. In this lectionary, Mary is always celebrated on the fourth Sunday of Advent. We must do this well today. For this is her place in different, in, in, among the different liturgical seasons of the church. She is, of course, also a vital part as well in the feasts that follow Christmas and also extend its spirit. These are the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, the Solemnity of Mary, the Holy Mother of God on New Year's Day, and the Epiphany of the Lord on the 6th of January, and the Baptism of the Lord the following week. These portray for us Mary's crucial influence on her son. Mary taught him to read, taught him his ABG, A, B, G, D, H, W, Z, K, you know how the alphabet goes ends up with Q-R-S-T, Hebrew alphabet. You have to read it backwards. <laughs> she taught him to read the scriptures. She explained the world to him. It's good points and it's bad. And in his public ministry, Jesus dealt wisely with many different types of people. He had a group trying to put him down all the time. They put forward a woman who had a crippled woman on the Sabbath, thinking that if he healed her, they could convict him of practicing medicine on the Sabbath, which was illegal. He said to her, stand out in the middle. Which one of you would not take his ox or his ass and give them a drink of water on Sunday? On, on, on the Sabbath. This woman's put up with this infirmity for 40 years. Stretch out your hand. She did so and was cured without being touched by him. They couldn't convict him of practicing medicine on the Sabbath. So he lived with an opposition right from the beginning. And he did it very well. He understood the people he was talking to. Mary helped him to understand that. 
Pope St. John XXIII gave us the Feast of the Holy Family to follow immediately after the celebration of Jesus' birth at Christmas. This to help us recollect that Jesus was born into a family. Pope John asked why, with lay people, at least 80% of the Catholic Church, there were no husband and wife saints in the Catholic Church. This was not to disparage religious life in the church, both male and female. Also, ordinary priests are noticeably missing from the number of saints. They have no one, no group of people to gather, to gather together and to pool their money to promote the process, the difficult process of making a saint. These subgroups, there was a long-standing opinion that the parents of St. Therese of Lisieux should be saints. And now they are, they've been canonized. Just a husband and wife who lived a secular life. Where do married people find examples of sanctity in their daily living? The answer came with this new feast, the Holy Family, and by locating it right next to Christmas. This emphasized that our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, was born into a family and grew up within a family, and now we need some hymns to do this feast honour, hymns about the holiness of married people living their vocation in a secular environment. Some cynics say we canonise Jesuits by the busload. <laughs> so today we do have a feast of two ordinary people who are married. Though Mary was with child during her espousal period, considered a marriage already, and Joseph was considering divorcing her till he was revealed, was revealed to him that Mary's pregnancy was by divine intervention. Joseph believed this and he took Mary to his home so that Jesus was regarded as his son by law. It was through Joseph that Jesus is a relative of King David. Evangelist Matthew emphasises this. He begins his gospel with a genealogy of Jesus born into Joseph's family. All important people had to have a genealogy. Now this one has long gaps within it. It ends with Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and of her was born Jesus, who was called Christ, Matthew 1.16. Evangelist Luke has Mary's genealogy, Luke 3.23. And Jesus is described as, as was thought, the son of Joseph. Mary and Joseph are distant cousins. They have two common ancestors, Shealtiel and Zerubbabel. And in a tribal system, all marriages were between distant cousins. In this way, both evangelists emphasize Jesus' family, and we need to learn what they taught us today. Next is King Ahaz, Judah's king from 735 to 715 BC. He's one of the most despised people in the Old Testament. When the Assyrians invaded, the Assyrians were the most cruelest and most hated people of the ancient world. They conquered Galilee, destroyed its capital city, and deported the entire group of Galileans to their land and put them in small groups so they'd intermarry with the locals, have half-caste children who'd be pagans. They were experts in getting rid of civilian people. And there was not going to be any more Jewish nation anymore. So they were hated by everyone. This man, instead of getting the southern kingdom together into an army and fighting them, he joined them instead, became a vassal, sold a lot of furniture from the temple to pay the tax that they imposed, and they demanded that the Jewish royal family be eradicated. 
He agreed. He killed his own children. What man would ever do that? The royal family was to come to an end. Prophet Isaiah mocked him. Fool, you missed one. Your wife, the young maiden, word isn't virgin in Hebrew, she's pregnant. There's one more left. And people saw this as a miraculous deliverance. The Greek Septuagint uses the word for virgin so that these historic words would become a prophecy. The Messiah, Emmanuel, would have a miraculous conception. And so it was. Mary consented to be the mother of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And God came to live among us humans. How great then is Mary. Let us honour her and St. Joseph who married her. Something must be said how modern families live out their vocation in this secular world. Recent popes have said that things to have things to say about the difficulties of doing this. Pope Francis, in summarising the collective wisdom of the Vatican Council, the Vatican Synod on the love in the family in 2016, said in the Morris Letizia, the joy of marriage, number 48. The weakening of faith in some societies has an effect on families, leaving them more isolated amid their difficulties. One symptom of this is loneliness, the absence of God in a person's life, plus the fragility of relationships. In number 316, we read, a positive experience of family communion is a true path to daily sanctification and mystical growth, a means of deeper union with God, lay people, in carrying out their duties in married life well, become holy by doing this. The fraternal and communion demands of family life are an incentive to growth in openness of heart and thus to an ever fuller encounter with the Lord. There are a string of papal announcements similar to this one. So living a full Christian life within the Catholic family today is of vital importance in this secular world we live in. So today's scripture readings are not a kind of pious history lesson. They should encourage all Catholic families to pray together, to live out their Christian vocation within their family, and especially to experience love and mutual encouragement there. This positive attitude is then spread to the civil community by those who have experienced it first in their own families. St. Joseph and Our Lady are put before us today as the best example of how a marry, of happy marriage. Let us honour them and try to make them a Christian family, a happy each Christian family, a happy one in their image. As the Messiah, Jesus was a model of this kindness and happiness. His first words on his Sermon on the Mount reflected this, how happy are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When the first free to lie arrived, they got all the convicts off ship, wrote their names down, put their religions beside them. And to their horror, they discovered that 80% of them were Catholic. What they had was a kind of nascent Catholic takeover bid, of the new colony of New South Wales. So after scratching their heads, they said, don't annoy the Catholics, just leave them alone. <laughs> we, uh, Governor Macquarie would give a block of land to every convict who'd finished his sentence, plus four convicts to help them farm it. He couldn't care where they came from as long as they produced food for the colony and the danger of starving. Somehow or other, the Catholics were useful. Just leave them alone and let them work. This was a totally secular society 
whatever happens in this society has got to be put there. And he wanted the Catholics to do their job putting it there. So when one convict priest finished his sentence, he told him to say Mass in Parramatta, a place out near Rouse Hill and in Sydney on three different Sundays and forbade the Catholics in these areas from going from one place to the other and joining together, keep them apart. He thought this was a good way of having liberal toleration of a nuisance that uh, had become one by all these stupid Irish people wanting Irish politicians to run their country and not the British. So Catholics were there at the beginning and a complete nuisance. We've gone on being a nuisance ever since. So cheer up. <laughs> Hello, fellow nuisance makers. <laughs> this is a secular country. Whatever gets put in this country gets put by someone, a group of people who know what they're doing. And we want the Catholics to put the Catholic faith first within the community so it becomes a Christian community. So uh, that's our vocation. The Seekers have just retired, an excellent group of singers of folk songs. They've been going for 50 years. They reflect the happiness towards each other in their songs. Their female singer, Judith Durham, petite and feminine, attempted to ask which of the three men singing with her is she a girlfriend to? Instead, she said, her three companions have always treated her with joy and respect. It's like having a father and two brothers, she said. She's happily married to someone else and has two young daughters. They are happy, this Australian band that replaced the Beatles. All are excellent musicians in their own right. They practiced hard, they played well, they sang folk songs. To tell of those overcoming the difficulties of life and remaining happy under difficult conditions. So they became an inspiration and were a very wonderful group. Today we ask that Mary's contribution to the Catholic Church be somehow duplicated. We need to fill all areas of civil society with our practice and our theory and our prayer and our sacrifice. So these people wrote a song about Australia. Someone said Australia's land flowing with milk and honey if you bring your own cows and bees. <laughs> There's sort of nothing there. <laughs> What's there, you've got to put it there. So this reflects, this is their song. I came from the dream time, from the dusty red soil plains. I am the ancient heart, the keeper of the flame. I stood upon the rocky shore, I saw the tall ships come. For 40,000 years I've been, I am the first Australian. I came upon a prison ship bound down with iron chains. I fought the land, endured the lash, waited for the rains. I am a convict, a freed man. I am, I became Australian. I'm the daughter of a digger who sought the mother load. The girl became a woman on the long and dusty road. I'm a child of the depression. I saw the good times come. I'm a bushy, I'm a battler. I am Australian. I am the hot wind of the desert. I'm the black soil of the plains. I am the mountains and the valleys, the droughts and flooding rains. I am the rock, I am the sky, the rivers when they run. I'm the spirit of this great land. I am Australian. 
It's for us to put the teachings of Christ to work in the secular civil society that decided long ago we didn't belong here. So hello fellow rebels, let's get on with the job.